Hi, I'm Father Chris Alar, and welcome to the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy, coming to you live here as we are preparing tomorrow for the beginning of Advent. You can see on your screen. Now, before we pray, I just wanted to say something about this talk today. This talk is going to not probably be the most exciting of talks, but I'll tell you, there are few more important and you're going to see why, because Advent, we have forgotten the meaning and the message. And I'm also going to bring into this the end times and the judgment. And I'm going to build on from my earlier talks. This is not the same as my earlier end times talk. But, uh, actually, I had three of them. But you can see the connection of what Advent is about and why it's so important for us, especially in these times. So let us uh, take you back to seminary. As I'm excited, I worked a little bit with Chris Sparks. I worked back on my uh, notes that I had on the liturgical year classes. And I'm telling you, this is so good that you are here because we are about to begin this season and this journey that's very important. So let us pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we ask you send the Holy Spirit down upon us for this incredibly important season of Advent to give us the knowledge of our faith so we can love our faith even more and to be able to open our hearts to receive that grace you wish to, do, to give to us and to dispense into our hearts. Mother Mary, we ask that you accompany us on this journey, this journey that is going to prepare us for the comings of Christ. And we ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, God bless you for joining us. We've had some real troopers here. Um, we had a big snowstorm here in the Brookshire Mountains of Western Massachusetts last night, and I didn't think anybody was going to make it, but we have some nice people here. We even had one former seminarian, Derek, that came all the way up on a bus from Florida to come to this talk. So uh, we got a, a great guy named Frank here with us that's battling and keeping going to keep this mission alive. So God bless all of you for joining us today. Now, as we said at Advent, let's look at our... Um, uh, well, we showed the first screen. This is the meaning of Advent and the end times, including the judgment, the final judgment. Now, Latin is the word for adv Advent, for uh, Latin for Adventus, Adventus, which means to come to, all right? To, it begins on the, people always think that, they, you know, this is a good question for seminarians. When does Advent begin? It begins on the Sunday nearest the Feast of St. Andrew. But nobody knows this, right? So Advent begins on the Sunday nearest the Feast of St. Andrew, which is November 30th. So we are beginning tomorrow. This is the beginning of Advent, and we are going to get you ready for this. It's so important. Now, it goes for four Sundays and begins a whole new church year. So this is truly Happy New Year right? Not the Julian or the Gregorian calendars, really the truly new year if you're living your faith is tomorrow. This is the beginning of a new church calendar year. Now, what is it that John the Baptist said, right? Prepare the way of the Lord. So Advent is most of all a preparation. So it's a preparation, and this is where it gets important because we think of just the preparation. Let's look at our next slide. Brother Mark can show us. This is a beautiful picture of the nativity and 95% of Catholics, when asked what Advent was, 95% when Catholics were asked what Advent is, said preparing for the birth of Jesus, if they even got it at all, but only 5% knew that it is more than just the birth of Jesus in the flesh. Well, how could you get more than that, Father? Well, it's the three comings of Christ. Yes, we are preparing for him coming in the flesh, the nativity, the birth of Jesus, Christmas. But also, we're preparing for the second coming. And that's going to be a big part of this talk today. I'm going to add, as I said, to the end times talk that I've done before. And then finally, daily, the coming of Jesus daily into our hearts in Holy Communion. This is the most forgotten of all. And do you realize that that's what Advent is? So we have to prepare. This is kind of like Mary at Cana, 
preparing for the way of Jesus. What happened at Cana? Basically, the, the jars became empty. There's a whole meaning to Cana. Cana is just not about Jesus working a miracle. The wedding feast at Cana is about us like the jars. Remember, we have to be a vessel. Jesus told St. Faustina, and you know, you all want to get to heaven, I want to get to heaven. The only way we get to heaven is grace. And, and Jesus told St. Faustina that trust is that vessel by which all grace is received. So we have to be a vessel to capture this grace that God is pouring upon us. Now, if our vessel is full of junk, right? If it's full of, of ourselves, if it's full of leisure and, and nothing but pleasure and no sacrifice, then we're full of garbage. All that grace God wants to pour on us is not gonna, it's not gonna fill us. We have to be emptied like the jars at Cana so that Jesus can fill us with that wine of the Holy Spirit. This is the meaning of what we're doing at Advent, all right? So we have to reduce the amount that our jars, our vessels are filled with ourselves. That's why John the Baptist said, I must decrease so he can increase. He's like a jar at Cana. Decrease himself so that Jesus can fill us. This is the message. Now, we empty ourselves. So rather than indulging this year, right, we should respond with a prayer. And there's a beautiful prayer in our, in our prayers, the Miriam prayers, Lord, hasten to fill the emptiness within me at Christmas. Now, you can become empty in two ways. As I just said, empty ourselves willingly, or you can be empty because of your own loneliness, your own anxiety, your own depression. Make that prayer, Lord, Fill the emptiness within me this Christmas as I know only you can fully fill me, fill my soul. All right, so this is what Advent is about. It's a time of prayer and fasting, but it's also a time, this is most important, of waiting and hope. Why is this important? All right. Advent is all of this, prayer, fasting, waiting, hope, but it's also a time of penance. Did you know this? Did you know Advent's a penitential time? Now, I've heard some other people say, and I'm going to explain this, that Advent is not a penitential season, and I'm going to explain this in a minute, so stay with us. But anyway, it is a time of reforming our life in a way similar to Lent. Do you know in Lent, we wear purple, but we also wear purple in Advent. Let's have Brother Mark show the next slide. Here is something I didn't even know till seminary. Did you know there's two different purples? When you see a priest wear his purple, and I bet if they did a poll on this, 95% of priests wouldn't know this. There's two types of purple. Look at the purple on your left. This is a reddish purple for the blood of the passion. And this is called Roman purple that we wear in, Ad, uh, in Lent because it represents the passion, the blood. That's why some purple is more a plum colored. It's the red of the blood mixed in with the purple. Now, the other purple on your right is a deep, rich, dark blue purple. We call that royal blue, royal purple. And that's what the priest wears at Advent. So they shouldn't really, but you know, there's, I mean, let's say, put it this way, priests could do worse things than wear the wrong color purple at Advent, but this is the point. Now, Advent, <clears throat> Advent then is a time in a way of penance. Some, it originated as a 40-day fast. How did Advent even come about? It was a 40-day fast in preparation for Christmas. In the same way, Lent is a 40-day fast, I'm sorry, um, yes, Lent is a 40-day fast in preparation for Easter. So we all know about the Lent 40-day fast for Easter, but how many we know that Advent was created by the church as a 40-day fast in preparation for Christmas? And so they're very similar. Now, in a way, why do we fast? So that the spirit can control the flesh and not the other way around. Fasting produces in us a longing, a clamoring for things that we willingly gave up. Why do we give things up? 
again so we can empty ourselves like the jars of Cana so that Christ can fill us with the Holy Spirit. So important. Now, fasting produces in us this longing. Now, during Lent, we sometimes give up things we like, like soda or chocolate. But here's the thing. In Advent, we should go and make more of a sacrifice, all right? It doesn't have to be material things. Like, I mean, it could be, but it doesn't have to be. How about giving up complaining or gossiping? or talking badly about other people. Now, sometimes our brethren need correction, okay? I never want to get confused here because sometimes we have to call out our loved ones. I have to be called out. You know, there was a couple times that I didn't even realize I was doing something and somebody called me out on it. And later I'm like, whoa, at first I was defensive. And then I was like, you know what? That was out of love. And so we lovingly correct. That's a work of mercy, right? We lovingly correct our brothers if they're on the wrong path, our church, our priests, our bishops even. But most of all, let's try to keep it in love. But anyway, maybe you can give up some of your time. You know, the three T's, you've heard me say this, your time, your treasure, and your talent. We have, we, if somebody says, well, Father, I have nothing to give, I always smile. And I said, no, I understand. You may not have any treasure because maybe you're financially falling on hard times. Understood. Maybe you don't have too much talents. Um, if, you're, if you're not a good carpenter or a good finance guy, maybe there's not a lot of talents you can offer. But if you have no treasure and no talent, that means you have a lot of time. And so you can donate, you can volunteer. And again, we know people are sick, people are, people are unable sometimes. Um, but something to keep in mind during Advent, time, treasure, and talent. That's how you're going to get to heaven. Do you know, I saw a talk online by, by one of the priests that said, you know, Jesus really focused on the one way that we could, we could end up in hell. Surprisingly, it wasn't a sexual sin or it wasn't, you know, a, a sin over um, anger. He said, surprisingly, the one place Jesus said they could end us up in hell is he says, not helping others. Matthew 25, the sheep and the goats, feeding the hungry, giving drink to the thirsty, clothe the naked, visit the prisoners. And so keep that in mind. Very, very important. All right, let's keep going. Now, a penitential season in some sense. Do you know that marriages don't usually happen during Lent or Advent? Marriages usually don't happen during those times. Now, they can technically if you get special permission, but we usually don't have marriages during Lent and Advent because of this penitential nature. Now, this doesn't make penance bad, right? The penance of Lent, as we said, why do we do penance of Lent? Because it prepares for the joy of Easter, right? And why do we do the penance of Advent? It prepares for the joy of Christmas, as I said. Now, there is one Sunday, however, of joyful celebration in both Lent and Advent. Do you guys remember this? I bet you do from being a kid. Let's look at our next slide, Brother Mark can put up. Gaudate Sunday. Gaudate Sunday means rejoice. And it is the third Sunday in Advent. And the priest wears rose, not pink, right? Rose. And so we have a similar Sunday in Lent. Let's look at our next slide. Letare Sunday. This is a beautiful celebration on the fourth Sunday of Lent. Now, both people, or I'm sorry, both times the priest wears rose. Why? Because in the midst of this penance season of purple, the priest is stopping to lead the people in rejoice. Rejoice. And so this is very important. So joy. Joy is what it's about. One Sunday of that Lent and one Sunday of that Advent is called rejoice. Now, why do they say joy and not happiness? I find this very interesting. What's the difference? Are joy and happiness the same? Father, I am so unhappy. My relationships with my family, uh, my health, uh, my job, uh, the fear of getting sick, I'm just really unhappy. You can still have joy. What's the difference between joy and happiness? 
Joy is greater. Happiness is determined by your circumstances. Right now, I'm not real happy because my family is struggling greatly. And I'm not the only one. So many people this year have incurred circumstances that have caused some unhappiness, health, um, circumstances with work. Um, my mom was just removed from the nursing home. We spent all that time getting her into a nursing home and they, they removed her. They said they, 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 they're not equipped to be able to handle my mom. Her situation is a little too rough. And so just before I came to this talk, I'm on the phone with my father, just heartbroken. What are we going to do? They won't take my mom and we can't, you know, we can't, my father can't care for her. So again, I'm looking at plane flights. Thank you for your prayers to get back home. You see, our circumstances can lead to unhappiness. Maybe we lose our job. Maybe we're running low on money. These are circumstances that can cause unhappiness. True. However, joy is knowing that you are a child of God, knowing that God still loves you no matter what the circumstances, and the joy knowing that eternal life is something greater than what we have right now in this earth. That's why if we're spending all our time focused on this life, on this earth, we're gonna be stuck in and out of happiness and sadness. But if we keep our eyes focused on heaven, all of a sudden joy will permeate us. I had a woman drive all the way from Buffalo. I don't know if she's watching today, but her name is Kate. She drove six hours to come to me yesterday to do a general confession. And she said, Father Chris, I really believe that I kept asking Jesus to, you know, shouldn't I just go to a local priest? And she lives six hours away in Buffalo because she drives slowly. She's, um, she's in a wheelchair. She has her own separate vehicle. And the weather was getting bad. We had snow yesterday. And she said, no, the, the, Jesus kept putting her heart to come here. And I said, well, God bless you. Um, yes, let me make some time to meet with you and we'll do a general confession. We met for three hours. And at the end of that three hours, I looked at her and I said, Kate, I'll tell you this. God didn't send you here for you. He sent you here for me. I said, I've listened to you for three hours and I am mortified. And she looks at me, she says, I'm sorry for, I said, no, 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 not you. I said, because you have more challenges than almost anybody I've met. You can't walk, you are degenerating with so many physical ailments, but you are maybe the most joyful person I've ever met. I said, I know why God arranged you to come here today and it wasn't just for you. It was for me because the joy that you exhibit, she's, and like, I kept testing her like, well, what if, what if God takes this away from you? How would you feel? And her just, her reaction was just constantly joy. And I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm just, wow, Lord, you never stop teaching us, especially through other people. It really affected me. And so I realized that that here we were planning this, and I was like, well, okay, she was called here by God to see a particular priest. Uh-uh. The priest was called to her to learn a lesson, and that's how God works. And so when we practice the sacraments, when we live our faith, we run into people like that. I am so blessed to have the people that we have here at the shrine. As I just look at the people that took their time to spend with us on Saturday. I see Mary every week here on the, in the front pew. Brother Mark and Brother Ken upstairs in the, in the, in the balcony every, every day making these live streams work. I see Frank, who's sick, who makes it in here through a snowstorm to get here today. This is the kind of beautiful joy that you have when you live your faith and you surround yourself with other people who have a living faith. And all these people, like Derek today, comes up, takes a bus from Florida in a snowstorm, former seminarian, just to come here to hear our talks. God bless you for, and God, thank you, God, for having a family of, of this, like this, in the Marian family. It's amazing to me. And so God never stops teaching us. Well, anyway, I'm joyful because I know God loves me no matter what happens. Joy is a choice. Joy is a choice that I'm going to live 
with God. We can see this. And you know what's interesting? Because yes, we can see that while both seasons, joy, uh, Advent and Lent, have a character of preparation and penance, okay? Lent is preparing for Easter and doing some penance. Advent is preparing for Christmas and doing some penance. Here's the thing. I, I saw a talk by Father Mike Schmitz, and I was doing my research for this, and he says, it, pen, uh, Advent is not a penitential season. And I'm like, mm, that's not what I read. And then I started questioning myself. Like, what does the church really teach here? And Father Michael Schmitz is like, no, it's not a penitential season. It's not a penitential season. And then I went on and all these other places are saying, it's a penitential season. It's a penitential season. So I'm like, wait a minute. Father Mike Schmitz is a good priest and these other people are good priests. What, what is it? So I went to the catechism. That's where you ought to go. Don't go to us priests. Go to the catechism. And so the catechism spells this out for us. And so does the teachings of the church. It says basically this. It says, while both seasons, Lent and Advent, have character of both preparation and penance, Advent is predominantly preparation with penance, and Lent is predominantly penance with preparation. Did you get that? So Lent is predominantly preparation, but in it has a penitential aspect. All right, most people think that early December is part of Christmas. Okay, we're coming up in the next few weeks. This is Christmas season. Lights are coming up. It's a time to buy gifts, um, you know, for Christmas Day. No, no. Advent ends on December 24th. That's a separate season. It's entirely separate from Christmas. All right, we are to preparing for the coming of Jesus, not just the preparing of Christmas decorations. Although that's fine, it brings, excuse me, it brings happiness, right? The Christmas season actually starts, doesn't end on Christmas Day. And so we'll be talking about that more in future talks. And so it ends, the Christmas also is not just one day. Christmas is a whole season, like Advent is the next four weeks. Christmas is a season all the way till when? Christmas Day till when? When does the Christmas season end? We'll talk more about this, the baptism of Jesus, and we'll talk more about that, all right? So anyway, this is important. Now, um, this is a part of the preparation for Jesus. Now, how did the wise men prepare for the coming of Jesus, right? They brought the gifts, right? You need to bring your gifts to Jesus. What did the wise men bring? All oh, you all know this, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, right? But do you know what they were for? Gold was for a king, right? Frankincense was for a divine God, and myrrh was used for burial, showing that he is a man, that he will die. And so Christmas to the Epiphany, which we'll talk more about as well, that's the 12 days of Christmas. You know that song, 12 days of Christmas? That's Christmas to the Epiphany. And so this is important. This is why we, you know, we sing that song. Well, anyway, Christmas Eve and after is then when we should really have our decorations up. But again, there's nothing wrong like the priest wearing the different purple. If you put your decorations up, that's okay. But technically, my mom, we used to always notice the neighbors would take the Christmas decorations down on Christmas. That's actually missing it. So don't remember or don't forget that. All right, next slide. Let's have Brother Mark show us. Now, when does Christmas happen? And it ties to Advent here because Christmas happens right after the winter solstice. Look at your screen. The solstice is when the earth is tilted most away from the sun. So guess what? It's the darkest day of the year. Then every day gets lighter afterwards. This is why Christmas, where Jesus was born, was right after the winter solstice, because every day after it brought more light into the world. And this is what it is. Each day is going to get longer. So prepare now for that light. Now, next slide. We talked about decorations, but one decoration you should have during Advent is the Advent wreath. It's in the shape of a circle. Take a look at your screen. You all see it. We have it right here. It's a circular um, evergreen um, wreath with candles, right? Purple and one rose. Let's talk about that. All right. 
The Advent wreath is in the shape of a circle. Why? Because it symbolizes eternity. God is like a circle, no beginning, no end. So the Advent wreath that you'll see placed right here tomorrow has no beginning and no end. It's a circle, right? Now, what's next? It has basically holly in it. You know what holly is? I used to live in Holly, Michigan. And they used to have the little symbols of the little holly leaf. It's prickly. If you touch it, it can poke you. Do you know why there's holly inside the Advent wreath? It's like that Advent wreath is the crown. And in it is the thorn. So we have holly, you know those songs, piles of holly, fa la 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 la, and all that? We're missing the whole meaning here. The holly is inside that wreath to represent the thorns that Jesus endured when he was crowned with a circle, like the advent wreath, right? This was a crown of victory, but the prickly holly were like the crown of thorns. Now this thing is made of evergreen. Why? Because it stays green all the time. It doesn't die, which is representative of internal life, immortal life. As we said, there's candles. There's three purple candles and a rose color candle. We represent the purple, we said, represents Penance or waiting. And the rose, as we said on the third Sunday of Advent, represents what? Joy. Gaudate. Why? Because Christ is only one week away. That's why it's on the third Sunday of Advent, because Advent's only four weeks long. And on the third Sunday, we're one week away. Rejoice. Christ is closer. We have the flame then of the candles. And do you know if flames don't make shadows? If you put a candle and we were to shine a light and you were to see the candle and the shadow of the wall and you would see my hand and you would see the candle, but there would be no shadow of the flame. Why? Because Christ is the ultimate flame itself. And so the candle has the flames and this is Christ is the light of the world. How beautiful. And since it's somewhat penitential, it's good that you do what during Advent? Hmm, confession. You know, the church only, de well, doesn't demand, what's the word, requires or gives us the uh, direction to go to confession at least once a year. And they say a good time is Lent. That's true. But we Marian fathers teach that we really should try to go every month or if you can't go every month, at least Advent and Lent. The two best times you could go to confession. Personally, I go every week. I mean, even if I've done something not too stupid this week versus last week where I've done something more stupid, I go every week. Now, let's not forget the reason for the season. It's not about material goods. Christ came once to redeem us. So we celebrate in the first coming of Christ, the nativity, the birth in the flesh, but then he will come again at the end of time to reconcile us back to him. So that's the second coming of Christ that we celebrate. And then the third in between, we receive him daily into our hearts through Holy Communion. Those are the three comings of Christ that we celebrate on Advent. One, the preparation of coming of Jesus at Christmas. 95% of Catholics think that's it, it's over. No, we then celebrate the second coming of Christ at the end of time, and then we celebrate the third coming of Christ, which is him daily into our hearts. Now, that's summarized on this slide, if Brother Mark can show it. These are the three comings of Christ. The nativity in the flesh, the second coming of Christ, and him coming daily in our hearts in Holy Communion. So we prepare ourselves through fasting and prayer. These are the ways that we get ready for these three comings of Christ. Now, fasting and prayer, not only like we do in Lent. Lent's probably a little bit more um, because Advent isn't quite as penitential. But still, we have that kind of feel to the Advent season. Now, after this will come the joy of Christmas. So I'm going to show you just a two-minute video. Now, I know it talks, this video talks even as fast as I do. 
It's really quick. They're going to throw a lot of things at you on the screen. So don't worry, we're going to keep this video posted. So if you want to go back later and watch it, you can pause it and read everything on the screen. It is a quick video, but it really does a good job of summarizing. So let's watch this summary, two minute summary on what is Advent. So I told you that video was a little quick, but again, we'll keep it posted so you can push pause in between. Uh, we just got the question, yes, violet. Uh, we use purple as kind of the color that most people know, but violet is the church color uh, for the season. And do you notice one thing? Do you know there's not one flag in the entire world that has purple? Of all the flags, the red, white, and blue of the United States and France and the greens and the yellows of Italy and Mexico, but there's not one flag in the whole world with purple. Hmm, kind of interesting, right? But we know, as Catholics, we need to carry that purple flag. And that is giving a little bit of penance to prepare for the joy of what's coming, what God, what eye has not seen, ear has not heard, what God has planned for us. All right, now, I, I, I did some more research and I, I gave you a lot of my seminary notes, but I found some stuff when I was doing my research and Chris Sparks helped me put together. And there's a, a priest out there named Father Roger Landry. And I wanna summarize some of the things he said because I thought they were very good. Now, remember I mentioned to you earlier that Advent starts a new church calendar, right? It's a new year. Now, each year the church begins focusing on the beginning and on the end of our existence, or I should say, of Christ's presence with us. All right, so the church begins each year focusing on the beginning and on the end so that we better live in the present. Three comings of Christ. The beginning of Christ's relationship with us through his birth, the end when he comes again, and then living in the present through Holy Communion. Let's look at this. The Eucharist. You know, I don't think it's coincidental that God had in mind. I don't think we recognize it. But did you notice Advent is right after Thanksgiving? Advent is always immediately after Thanksgiving. Most always the Sunday after Thanksgiving. Now, what does Eucharist mean? Thanksgiving. And then if we are in Advent preparing for the coming of Christ into our hearts, what's the most important thing Jesus told St. Faustina? The thing that hurts him the most of all is a lack of gratitude. That we receive him like a dead object. This is one of the things that so many people in the church now are trying to raise awareness. 
mentioned Frank's here with us, and, and Frank and I have talked about what, what does it take to revitalize? It's in recognition of the true presence of Jesus in the Eucharist, body, blood, soul, and divinity. When we lose that reverence, when we lose that, everything else is, is just meaningless. And so this is why we have, I believe, God placed Advent right after Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, the Eucharist means Thanksgiving. So we don't have to necessarily um, understand all of this to realize that, you know what, we should be excited over a new year. How many baseball fans get excited over the new season at spring training? Now, wait a minute. Father, this liturgical year is boring. We do the same thing all over again. All right, now. Every year, the liturgical year repeats the same feast days of the saints. You have Thomas Aquinas on July, uh, January 28th. You have Joe Kamenan on July 25th. You have all the saints days. And Father, it's boring. We just repeat them all over again. <clears throat> Do not baseball teams. All right, we're in Boston Red Sox country, even though watch out for the Detroit Tigers next year. They're going to be good. The, the whole new season, we're just playing another 162 games against the same teams you played last year. But doesn't everybody get excited? Does anybody say, well, you know, that's really boring because we did the same games against the same teams last year. Everybody would look at you and say, no, because the outcome can be different. We, we got swept by the Yankees last year, but this year we want to sweep the Yankees. It's the same schedule. But yet our, our Catholics look at this and just, eh, it's boring. We celebrate the same things. Okay, but you should celebrate them in a different way. Just like the same 162 game schedule in baseball, it's like the same 162 saints that we have on the church calendar. We should redo them each year with something new and invigorating. I think that's the way to look at it. Not something boring and repetitive. All right, we don't get excited, but we should. The experience of last year in a baseball season is meant to help us to get better this next year. Like the Detroit Tigers had to clean up their bullpen. Back in the mid-2000s, here I'm living in Boston territory, but back in 2014, there is no way Boston should have won that World Series. It should have been Detroit. They couldn't touch our starting pitchers. Couldn't even get a, a hit off of them. But as soon as we went into the seventh inning and they pulled them out, our bullpen came in, game over because we didn't have a bullpen. So the Tigers should look at that and say, next year, we're gonna learn from last year and we're gonna improve our bullpen. So you should look at the last year's liturgical calendar and say, where did I fail? Where did I lack in charity? Where did I lack in my attentiveness at mass and improve on that? Does that make sense? I think it's very important. So it can be like sports. I know Father Seraphim always told me, don't waste my time with sports, but I think there's a lot of analogies there. All right, so Jesus tells us in the gospel that when he comes, there will be winners and losers. This, is, this hogwash, if everybody gets a trophy, I, I've said before is craziness. People don't believe me, but when I was in first and second grade, this is the honest truth. When I was in first and second grade, I played in the holly, speaking of holly, remember the, the crown? When I played in Holly, Michigan, every week when the games were played, a parent was designated to bring the treats. And the treats were brought to the kids. And if we won, this is first grade. If we won, we got the treats. If we lost, the parent had to take those treats home. Now, I still keep in touch with some of my friends from that team, and not one of us is in therapy because of that. Not one of us. That helped develop our character. That helped develop into who we were to appreciate hard work and effort. This is what communism wants to destroy. Everybody gets a trophy. Well, yeah, then everybody comes and takes your trophy. And so this is important. So Jesus tells us basically there will be winners and there will be losers. Jesus doesn't say everybody will get a trophy. All right? And the majority of people, let's look at this. While the majority of people were drowning at the time of Noah, they didn't even see the storm coming. What was Noah doing? He was busy building an ark and waiting for God. 
God's word to be fulfilled. Noah was a winner. Those who weren't prepared were a loser. All right, Jesus tells us, and I don't mean loser in the thing like, oh, you're no good. I mean, those who are not prepared won't win. That's why in first grade we learn we got to practice, we got to prepare. Now, I, 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 they asked me to coach a couple years ago just kind of a, a helping, and there was, there was no sense of preparation. It was just, oh, well, you know, we just, we're, just, we, 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 you know, we're just not into that. What? We got to prepare. So Jesus tells us, how do we know this? Jesus tells us that history will repeat itself. He says when he comes again, some will be ready and some will not. He tells us that two men will do the same job in the field, but one will be ready and one will be not. This is not about the, the rapture. This is about preparation. He said two women will be in the kitchen. One will be prepared, one will not. He says a husband and a wife will be in the same bed, but only one will be ready, one will not. That's Luke 17, 34. This, again, this is not the rapture. This is being in a state of grace. Being ready in a state of grace. This is important. All right, next slide. Brother Mark's going to show. He has come into the world and basically built us a new ark, the church, giving us stockpiles of provisions through the sacrament, the Bible, his very presence in the Eucharist, but we must get on this ark. I love this phrase. Look at your screen. The church is like Noah's ark. It stinks. But if you get out of it, you'll drown. <laughs> Let me repeat that. The church is like Noah's ark. It stinks. But if you get out of it, you'll drown. That's why, thank God, we got some people that are trying to clean out the manure so that the church doesn't stink but those same people know they can't get off that ark. So many people, you're on a smelly ark, says, I'm jumping overboard, you're gonna drown. The best thing to do is get a shovel and scoop out that stench. And that's what we gotta do in our church. That's what's going on right now. This is, it's important work, right? All right, Jesus tells us in the gospel how to avoid making the same mistake those people did in Noah's time. Basically, stay awake. This is scripture to remain vigilant and alert for his return so that we won't fall asleep. What does he mean by fall asleep? Spiritually. All right, don't be caught off guard. All right, um, basically St. Paul tells us this. He says, live honorably. He says, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery or licentiousness. This is the way of our society today. Not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. No, I know that's not easy. But with the grace of God, we can do it. Thus, each one of you and myself included are faced with a choice. All right, the choice between light and darkness, light and death. We have a choice. If we elect to do those things, we're electing darkness and we'll remain in the dark. All right? We either have to make, we have the choice. We have a choice to make provisions for the flesh to gratify our desires or to make provisions for the spirit to have eternal life. What's it going to be? Jesus and his apostle, Paul, sound the alarm. Wake up. As you've heard me say, it's not about woke, it's about being awake. God bless Father Gomez who just talked about this whole woke movement and he said it's a false religion. So don't fall into this lie. Please, please. Now, we know that when Christ came into the world the first time, some were ready, but most were not. Hmm, sound familiar to today? All right, Mary, she was ready. Joseph, the shepherds, the magi, they were all ready. God comes into the world, Mary, Joseph, shepherds, magi, they were ready. But on the other hand, who was not ready? Herod. Herod was not ready. He was only worried about himself. The innkeepers, they were not ready. They were too caught up in their businesses and didn't have room for their own creator. The scholars of the law, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they were not even ready to make a short six-mile journey 
from Jerusalem to Bethlehem to see and meet their king. The vast majority of the Jewish people who had been awaiting the whole advent of their Messiah, coming, advent means coming, they weren't ready. For centuries, they waited, but they were not prepared when he first came. Let's not fall into this trap. The surest way for us to be ready when he comes in the future is to be ready now. Let's take a look at our next slide. Because he comes to us daily in the Eucharist. Even in a more humble disguise than a little baby. So this is why we have to be vigilant to see him. To see him in the Eucharist. Our response to Jesus in the Eucharist now is a very true indication of whether you are awake or not. When Jesus says, stay awake, and you ask yourself, well, gee, I'm awake now, I'm reading this. <laughs> no. Are you spiritually awake? Spiritually awake is an indication of how reverently you receive Holy Communion. This is what it's about. How we respond will be indicating how we will react when the second coming happens. How do we respond? Go to mass, go to the sacraments, stay in a state of grace. This is the real litmus test. Are you going to mass? Are you going to the sacraments? Are you going to confession? Are you receiving Holy Communion? Are you praying? This is your litmus test. Now, if you haven't been, this is your time. This is your New Year's resolution. Remember, everybody always makes a New Year's resolution, right? January 1st. We've all done it. How about making a new Catholic year, liturgical year resolution starting tomorrow? That I'm going to stay in a state of grace. I'm going to receive the sacraments. I'm going to go to Mass. This is what it's about. In this new liturgical year, let's get it right. You know, Emmanuel, God with us, has come. Let us adore him as the Magi. Now, this is nothing new. Because everybody says, well, Father, times are really hard right now. Back then, people had faith. Well, you know what? Today, we suffering Christians should look at the birth of Jesus in a similar way. Do you know that when the birth of Jesus happened, it was almost identical to today? People don't realize this. The same conditions. The world was torn a strife. There was the dictatorship of Rome, right? The world he was born into knew the evils of Roman rule, paganism. That's what we face today. The evil and the sadness that happened with it, yet the joy all of a sudden burst on the scene with the birth of Jesus. They now had a savior to save them and to reward their patience in waiting for him. You too will be rewarded if you patiently prepare and wait for him. That's why Advent is so important. In this world of impatience, I think impatience is the most under recognize sin. It's, I got a million faults, but impatience is probably for me, could be number one. We live in a world now that we don't want the microwave even taking 10 minutes to make our food. It's got to be done in two minutes. Second, we get in a traffic jam, we get impatient. The second that we can't get a TV program on demand when we want it, we get impatient. This is a world of impatience. So I think it's an absolute excellent opportunity to grow in virtue this Advent season by preparing and waiting. I always, it's when I go to the store, I always jockey to get the shortest line. <laughs> Maybe we could practice a little penance. Here's one I bet you've never done. Pick the longest line and offer it up for the holy souls. How many of us have done that? I just, it just like, oh, I can't, I got to go to the short line. It's a beautiful way to prepare for waiting, to teach us patience, right? What a strange world, right? Evil and suffering mixed with now joy when Jesus comes. It is all that makes Christmas a joyful event in every age, no matter what the circumstances, no matter what our pains and agonies, remember, happiness is determined by circumstances, 
joy can be ever present no matter what the circumstances. So no matter what strife the world is in, I remember my father once saying, this is not gonna be a joyful Christmas. No, it's maybe not be a happy Christmas, but it should always be a joyful Christmas because you know Jesus is with you. It is precisely because God understood our suffering that he came into the world in the first place. That's mercy. What is mercy? Mercy is a particular mode of love that when love encounters suffering, it takes action to do something about it. God saw our suffering of sin and decided to do something about it. What did he do? He sent his son. And now we are preparing for that arrival. This is so amazing. And yet, eh, ah, the Christmas season just gets me depressed. No, joy. This is what our faith teaches. It's because God understood our suffering that he sent his son in the mercy. A child was born who can change the world. Now he can change you if you let him. There's another priest I read, and I, I think this is really good. I want to mention some of the things that this Gerald, Father Gerald Murray mentioned about the coming of Advent. He said, you know, the church repeats the liturgical calendar to guide us to heaven. Now, the cycle of days and years is directed to what? What is the whole purpose of a cycle of days and years? To guide us to heaven and the last day. So we're ready for heaven, all right, when the Lord will come. Let's look at our next slide. Take a look at this. This is the vision I've always had of what it'll look like when Jesus comes again. You know, the reason the Jews don't accept Jesus is because their idea of a, a Messiah was a conquering hero with a sword coming in on horseback and overthrowing their enemies. Instead, here comes a pauper in sandals and torn rags. This is why the Jews, this is why Judas betrayed Jesus. Did you know that? Judas betrayed Jesus because Jesus wasn't this sword-wheeling, slashing-down-the-Romans kind of guy. And so Judas betrayed Jesus because of that. He's like, you're not my idea of the Messiah. And that's why most Jews rejected Jesus, because it wasn't their idea of the Messiah. He came as a pauper in humility, not a conquering hero. But how will Jesus come the second time? Let's have Father Mark put it back on the screen. That is how Jesus is going to come the second time. And this is amazing to me. And I don't know if my, the people here can see it in the crowd, but this is the picture of it. There's going to be Jesus, the conquering hero, with a sword, on horseback, leading his army to victory. We all know that God will win the war, but our jo job right now is to reduce the casualties in the meantime. That's why we're pouring it out. This is why you're here. That's why I'm a priest. That's why you're a Marian helper. Because Jesus will win this war, and this is how he's going to come again. That's when the Jews will be reconciled fully, if not even before that, with an illumination of conscience. So I think this is important. This is critically important. Now, here's the thing. All right? The first part of Advent directs our thoughts to the second coming of Christ. Do you know that the second coming of Christ will happen in your lifetime? Father, we don't know the day or the hour. Oh, yes, we do. Ah, oh, blasphemy. Contact the bishop. Turn in Father Chris. No. Everybody, the second coming will happen in your lifetime. Either Jesus will come again from heaven, as we just saw in that picture, or you will die. Both are the second coming of Christ for you, depending on which one happens first. So if you don't die before Christ comes again in the second coming, that will be the second coming. Or if you die, you're going to meet him, and that will be the second coming of Christ for you. So we have to prepare. So the first part of Advent, the readings and the scriptures talk about the second coming of Christ or the end of our life. Thus we begin Christian the year, the Christian year, meditating on the end of time or on death, so we will be ready. We walk with him in order that we can walk with him when he comes to judge the living and the dead. Walk with him now so that you will be ready to walk with him when he comes on that horseback as the conquering hero. We honor the Savior best 
by making ourselves ready for when he comes again. Now, the second part of Advent directs our thoughts to his birth, to the person who fulfilled all the prophecies in, Bible, in the Bible. Now, the reality of the incarnation calls for our full attention to prepare for Christmas. Now, here's what's important. The penitential nature of the season, as we said, violet vestments, right? Purple or violet. Um, there's no Gloria at Mass, right? Teaches us, and that's why it is partially penitential. That's why when I hear that Advent's not penitential at all, that's wrong. Church says that's wrong because we don't sing the Gloria at Mass in Advent, all right? We wear violet, purple, because it is penitential. It teaches us that sin and the habit of sin need to be addressed. We just can't pretend that sin doesn't exist. Very important. This means seeking his pardon for our sins, living better as his true followers, a good confession, as I said a second ago, during Advent, is the most pleasing gift you can give Jesus at Christmas. Not gold, not frankincense, not myrrh. The best gift you can give Jesus at Christmas is yourself in confession and holy communion. Honor his birth with a spirit of adoration. You know what the first adoration was? Oh, I thought it was when, when uh, Jesus gave to St. Margaret Mary Alacoque the holy hour in 1673. No! The first holy hour was the Magi adoring Jesus in the manger. They were adoring him. That was the first adoration. And we can imitate that. Sharing gifts on Christmas is a way to imitate what they did. Powerful. All right? Now, I mentioned Advent. Um, I can skip this part here. Let's do that. All right, next. Um, all right, what about this? Advent asks us to stay. What does that mean, Father? Well, here I want to turn to uh, Elizabeth Scalia. Another, I did, I did doing a ton of research on this. I found some really gems out there. And I want, to, I want to save you having to read dozens of hours of research and just kind of condense things for you to be able to give you. And I'm using, like I said, my notes from seminary. Chris Sparks and I worked on some of this. But this was a really good, interesting point. Um, Elizabeth said that the liturgical year, as it winds down, we are each day treated to the apocalypse. <laughs> oh, gee, Father, that doesn't sound too enticing, right? Well, okay. She said, well, at every Mass, the church declares that we wait in joyful hope for the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Does that sound familiar? I say it every day in the Mass. As we await in joyful hope for the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, how is that possible when at the exact same time in the readings, we are reading about destruction, disaster, the apocalypse. How can we go from the joyful hope to the readings of the scriptures? You ever catch that in Mass? I was sitting here yesterday at Mass, or uh, yes, yesterday at Mass, thinking that. And then I saw this online. I was like, oh my gosh, this, answer, this is exactly what I was thinking about yesterday. How can we sit there and talk about the joyful hope of the coming of our Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ after reading these readings that talk about the destruction and they're the bells to be able to say yes, all right? So bottom line is this. These readings, yes, they can feel terrifying, but we heard Christ Jesus say this. People, and how do you reconcile this? Jesus said people will die of fright. This is Luke 21, 26 to 28. Let's read this on your screen. People will die of fright in anticipation of what is coming upon the world. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. But when these signs begin to happen, stand erect and raise your heads because your redemption is at hand. Luke 21. Okay, so joyful hope, people dying of fright, what gives? Yeah, run away from sin. 
That's what causes the fright. And when you run away from sin and to Jesus, you find joyful hope. The medicine is not found in another pill from the pharmacy. The medicine is found in the Holy Eucharist. Now, please don't write letters. I'm not saying that to take your medicine. Please, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is the true medicine of the soul. Yes, we need medicine for the body. But the medicine for the soul is the Eucharist. And Advent is asking us to do that. Lift our heads. Stay. To stand and watch. Because darkness is coming. Right? Darkness is coming. It's drawing near. So to give witness to the victory of light over dark, you want to be a part of it. And by fact that you're watching with us now, you are already holding your head up. To even watch this video, <laughs> you got to hold your head up. You're doing it. And then stand in those glorious beams of light. That light that made all things new. You know one of the most moving parts of the passion for me? You remember Mel Gibson's The Passion? You remember that? I think one of the most stirring moments for me is Jesus as he was on his way in the passion and he was being beaten and spat upon and he was being kicked and whipped and he looks up at his mother and he says, see, I make all things new. I was like, wow. I was like, tears were running down my eyes. He's going through that, that torture, and yet what's he focused on? He's making all things new. Man. This is what I want to say to my friends who've left the church. We all know them. We have family members. My own family. Hmm. There are a few things more painful than those who have left or those who are struggling with the church and don't even attend Mass, maybe haven't formally left. But don't go into the darkness. Don't jump off that ark. You jump off that ark, you're going to drown. You run into the darkness of the forest, you're going to get lost. You need the light. Be willing for now to keep company with Christ. Yes, he was deeply wounded by his bride, the church. Consent, yes, for now to share in these hard times, but hold fast. Don't give up. Going back to sports, Jimmy Valvano, North Carolina State, when I think it was the 1983 National Championship, absolutely the biggest underdogs in the history of the NCAA. Nobody gave him a chance to win. And when they won, there's a film of him running around the court. He didn't know what to do. They won at the buzzer. And he's running around the court. He, he's looking for somebody to hug. He doesn't even know what to do. And later he got cancer. And he was dying. And he went up for some award. And all he said, because everybody knew his story. Everybody knew he was dying for cancer and he could throw in the towel. And all he kept saying was, don't give up. Don't ever give up. Yeah, the church is making us grumble and groan right now. But don't give up your faith. Clean up the church. Hold fast. These times, they're going to get harder. The darkness is going to grow darker. Hold on, because the light is coming. That's what Advent is about. Right now, up to the solstice, the winter solstice is getting darker and darker and darker all the way through Advent. Physically, in the universe, with the heavens, the stars, it is getting darker and darker because the earth is tilting farther and farther away from the sun. Then the winter solstice hits and Christmas happens, and then all of a sudden, everything starts getting lighter and lighter and lighter. This is not some pagan sun god. This is the real light of Christ. Powerful stuff. All right, so this is it. Hold on, because the light is coming. The darkness will not overcome it. Remember the word Israel? You know what Israel means? Struggle. Israel, the word Israel means struggle. 
It's not going to be easy. We are all little Israels right now, struggling. But hold on, because the Advent promise is going to prevail. Advent is an apocalypse. Here I turn to a guy named Carl Olson. I'll show our next slide. Advent means, well, let's jump ahead. Let's go to apocalypse. Advent is apocalyptic. Apocalypse is from the Greek word meaning to reveal, to unveil. That's why the book of Revelation, called the book of the apocalypse, is not about the rapture or the antichrist. It's about the mass. The book of Revelation is about the mass. Because the mass is an unveiling. Jesus is hidden in the Eucharist, even more so than in the crib, in the manger. And that is unveiled at the mass. When mass happens, the, the roof of the church opens up and heaven and earth are united and it's unveiled. Scott Hahn tells us all the time, when you go to mass, you're, you're in heaven. Heaven is unveiled. We don't want to pass this up. So apocalypse means to unveil, but adventus, the Latin for advent, let's show back on the screen, means it's coming. It's coming. So advent should be a time where we're, 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 we're acknowledging it's coming. It's fast approaching. Jesus said you must also be prepared for an hour you do not expect the Son of Man will come. Now that's the second coming. Monsignor Ronald Knox said that the problem is that we want our Lord to come, but just not yet. Remember St. Augustine? This was me in my 20s. Lord, make me chase, just not yet. That was St. Augustine. Lord, make me chase, just not yet. No, the time is now. Make us faithful. Find our, we find ourselves wanting to commit ourselves, but we want to hold on to our sins. No. That's why in a, a paragraph 299 of the diary, it says, hide, Jesus says, hide in my rays from the wrath of the Father. And I remember I was giving a talk once and Father Kaz heard me and I said, yeah, hide in the rays of, of, of divine mercy from the wrath of the Father. And Father Kaz looks at me and said, no, no, Chris, don't, don't, don't be teaching it like that. I said, come on, Father, it says it right there in the, in the diary. And so Father Seraphim comes in the room and I, I quick grab Father Seraphim. Father Seraphim, doesn't the diary say, hide from the wrath of the Father? And he says, you have it all wrong. What he means, Father Seraphim said, is that sin is like a lightning rod. Here is sin. And if we are holding on to, well, here's the point, here's sin. And God will zap it. The wrath of God the Father is going to strike at sin. So here is sin. Here is the wrath of God the Father. He is going to strike at sin. The problem is, if you're holding on to it, you ever held on to a metal rod and then feel a jolt of electricity because it transfers through the rod? Sin is a lightning rod. When sin is going to be zapped by God the Father, if you're holding on to that sin, you're going to get zapped too. That's why we let go. We detach. And so to wrap this whole thing up, I want to finish with the end times because this is, this is important. So this is why we come. Advent is challenging us to let go, to detach, to stay awake, to be ready, to go to confession. All right, Advent is the end of the Old Covenant, basically, which genuinely looked for God to come. Jesus came. Now the Advent of the New Covenant started with the birth of Christ, continued since then with the Eucharist, and will end when he comes again. So you have all this Old Testament stuff. You know what the Old Testament is? The Old Testament is Advent. The Old Testament is a preparation and a waiting for the coming of Christ. The whole Old Testament is Advent. And then when you come to the birth of Jesus, that's his first coming. Then at the end of time, well, his second coming, and in between, which we are in right now, he comes daily in your heart in the Eucharist. This is the meaning. This is the story. All right? So God's coming to us in every Mass, and it will make completing 
This will be completed when he comes the second time. This is why Jesus said to be prepared at every hour for the hour. The hour of the apocalypse. It's all tied together. So here's where I wanted to finish. I got a couple minutes left. I want to add to the talk that I did last year called The Catholic View of the End Times. I have three, a series of three talks, and I'm going to add to that right now something that I didn't cover there. And I want to put the next slide up, Brother Mark. Signs that are to precede the general judgment. All right, if the Old Testament is really a time of Advent of waiting for Christ, then the new covenant comes with the birth of Christ. That's his first coming. And then from there, we receive him daily in the Eucharist. But then the final coming, the second coming of Jesus is the end. We got to say how to be ready. How to be ready for that. Now, I'm going to add to the five that I said in my talk, on my end times talk, I gave you five things that must happen in scripture before the end. And those five are still correct. But when you do some research, you'll find out there's four more. There's really nine things in scripture that have to happen before the end of time. Let's look at these. All right, theologians usually enumerate the following nine events as signs that Jesus is coming again. All right. One is to spread the gospel to the whole world. I said that on my last talk. The gospel must be spread to the whole world. Let's look at our next slide. How do we know this? Jesus says, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world for a testimony to all nations, and then the consummation will come. Very clear. You can't get any more clear than that. Jesus is saying, before the end, the gospel must be spread to all nations. I believe that's happening through things like this live stream. The devil thinks he won with the coronavirus. Uh-uh. Jesus is turning this on its head, is making a greater good, and now we're reaching more people than we've ever reached with the message of divine mercy. Praise be to all of you watching in all parts of the world. All right? Next. The conversion of the Jews. I also talked about this in my last talk. Conversion of the Jews towards the end of the world is foretold by St. Paul in Romans 11.25. The Jews will be converted. Now one thing, the next one, number three, that I didn't have, and I'm adding now, is the return of Enoch and Elijah. Why? Why does that must happen before the end times? The belief that these two men, did you know they, they didn't die? Enoch and Elijah did not die. So, they are reserved, they believe, theologians believe, for the last times to be the precursors of the second coming. The second advent. This is scriptural. Regarding Elijah, you can find it in Malachi 4, verse 5 and 6, Sirach, verse, chapter 48, verse 10, and Matthew, chapter 17, verse 11. Concerning Enoch, you can see him in Sirach 44, verse 16. All right, last couple notes. Next, I had this one in my talk last time, the great apostasy. Boy, are we seeing that now? Heck yeah, we are. St. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3, that they must not be terrified as if the day of the Lord were already at hand because first there must come a great revolt, an apostia, an apostasia. That means a falling away of the faith. Man, are we seeing that today. You know, the church fathers understood by this revolt a great reduction in the number of the faithful through the abandonment of the Christian faith in many nations. This is for, this is prophesied in Scripture. But don't say, well, then let it happen. No, you'll be judged in how you tried to stop it from happening. Getting your loved ones back. Christ said, but yet the Son of Man, when he cometh, shall he find... Think you, faith on earth? Question mark. That's Luke 18, 8. In other words, Jesus is saying there will be little faith on earth. All right, here's the next one I had in my previous talk. Let's look at our next slide. The Antichrist. The reign of the Antichrist. 
In that same passage, 2 Thessalonians, that I just mentioned, Paul indicates there's another sign, the revelation of the man of sin. Calls him the son of perdition. We know it better as the Antichrist. Now, people think the Antichrist is Satan. The Antichrist is not Satan. Satan cannot become incarnate. Only God has the power to become incarnate. Satan cannot walk around in human flesh and become a human. Only God can. So the Antichrist will be a man possessed by Satan. St. John says in 1 John 2.18 that he has to come in the last days. This is not some Catholic... I, 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 I don't mean this negatively, but I, I chuckle... When we give these talks and people write to us, this is not in the Bible. Yeah, it is. I got one of my end times talk that said this was all Catholic invention. Well, it's coming right from the Bible. It is generally agreed that before the second coming, there will come a powerful adversary of Christ who will seduce the nation by his wonders and persecute the church. All right. Next, the extraordinary disturbances of nature. I mentioned this too. The scriptures clearly indicate that the judgment will be preceded by a bunch of physical disasters. This is Matthew 24, 29, Luke 21, 25. War, pestilences, famines, and earthquakes. Matthew 24 tells us this. They're understood as the calamities of the last times. Next, conflagration. The earth will be stricken with conflagration. What is that? That means a great fire. In the apostolic writings, we are told that at the end of the world, there will be a general conflagration. But it will not annihilate the present earth or the present condition. It will change its form and appearance. Father, you're making this up. Nah, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10 through 13. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 2, etc. Finally, two more, the trumpet of the resurrection. All right, the trumpet of the resurrection. In the New Testament, it says a trumpet will awaken the dead to the resurrection. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 52, and 1 Thessalonians 4, 15, and John 5, 28. According to St. Thomas, there is reference in these passages either to a voice of Christ or an apparition of Christ which will cause the dead to to reunite with their bodies, a resurrection. Next slide. This is an awesome picture because you want to how to know I visualize, I searched long and hard for this picture because this is how I visualize it. The sign of the Son of Man will appear in the heavens. In Matthew 24, 30, let's look at this picture. It was indicated as a sign that would come right before Christ was to judge the world. It was called a cross of light. You want to know what's interesting? St. Faustina told us that before the end, Jesus said a cross will be in the sky and from the part, places on the cross where he was nailed, rays of light will come forth. Hmm, powerful. All right, so those are the nine things that according to scripture that must happen. But I'm gonna lastly mention circumstances about the general judgment, the who, what, when, and where. Let's talk about this. When will the judgment happen? Well, these signs that are to precede the judgment tell us nothing about when. All right? The day the Lord will come, he says, is a thief in the night. Nobody knows the day or the hour. All right? Where will it happen? All right? It seems that the general judgment will happen here on earth. Some infer from 1 Thessalonians 4.16 that the judgment will be in the air. Jesus will come and we will be risen up in the air. The newly risen being carried into the clouds to meet Christ. But others from the book of Joel, you know this, say the last judgment will be in the valley of Jehoshaphat. Let's look at the next screen. That's the valley of Jehoshaphat. You want to see where the book of Joel says the general judgment will be? It's a real place. It's right there in Jerusalem. And so, that is powerful. Finally, who will judge? Well, the whole trinity, yes. But the judgment, it is told to us, will be done by Christ. Not just as God, but as man. Because he's judging his peers. We are men, he is. 
This is John chapter 5, verse 26. This is because creation, why Jesus, why is he the judge? Because creation was through him, and in a special manner, wisdom was ascribed to him. So let's look at our last slide. You recognize that picture? That's the general judgment on the Sistine Chapel, Michelangelo. At the second coming, Christ will appear in the heavens, seated on a cloud and surrounded by angelic hosts. This is Matthew 16, Matthew 24, 25. The angels will bring all before him. This is Matthew 24, 31. Listen to this. The elect will aid Christ in a judicial capacity. That's 1 Corinthians 6, 2. And the lives of the just themselves will be a condemnation on the wicked. That's Matthew 21, verse 41. In other words, God doesn't condemn you. You condemn yourself. And if somebody says, there was no way I could live like that, Lord, he will point to the lives of the saints and show that we can, with the grace of God, live a life like that. But the apostles will also be special judges of the world in a deeper way because the promise was that they'll sit on the 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. This is Matthew 19, 28. And where do the Catholic priests come from? The apostles. And you know what the tribunal or what the confessional is called? It's not the tribunal of judgment. It'll be at the end of time we'll be judged. But right now the confessional is called the tribunal of mercy. Now is the time of mercy. But Jesus said, take advantage of it now because after that will come the time of justice. You don't want to be going through the doors of justice. We're not going to make it. We want the doors of mercy. So St. Thomas says that the greatest saints will make known the sentence of Christ to others. So you know what, everybody? Pray to those saints now. Get them on your good side now so they can intercede for you. All right, so who will be judged? All of us, good and bad. We will all appear in the judgment to give an account of our words, deeds, and prayers. The angels and the demons, will they be judged? Ah, here's a good question. Will angels and the demons be judged? Not directly. They were already judged at the time of the fall. They were either faithful like St. Michael or they either fell like Lucifer. Their eternal destiny has already been fixed. But because they played an influence over the fortunes of men, their sentence, which will be pronounced later, the sentence on man, will affect the demons. So although the demons are allowed to roam the earth right now, at the end they'll be thrown into hell, hell will be sealed. And you don't want to be part of that. What is the object of judgment? The judgment will embrace all our works, good or bad, every idle word, according to Matthew 12, 36, and every secret thought. Uh-oh, that's scary. Every secret thought. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 5. Theologians teach us that even the secret sins of the just will become manifest in order that judgment may be made complete and that justice and mercy of God may be glorified. Okay, Father, you said a couple months ago that if we go to confession and our sins are confessed, they will not be brought up at the general judgment. Yes, that is correct. If you are thinking that, you've been listening to these talks. But what I should have explained was not in a humiliating or embarrassing way. What's going to happen is that your pain or embarrassment, if you're a saint, will not be pain and embarrassment. It will add to the glory of God. It will be like St. Peter and St. Mary Magdalene. St. Peter and Magda Mary Magdalene were sinners. But doesn't that give more glory to God when we saw that they fell and then they got up and became saints? than if they had never sinned in the first place. That's how it will be for us. So actually, if you have a sinful past, ironically, that can give more glory to God if you repent now. I think that is amazing. So there's more rejoice in heaven over one repentant sinner than 99 righteous. Peter and Mary Magdalene, sinners. But after they repented, they became great saints. And now that gives glory to God. God didn't keep their sins private. 
Well, Father, you said it won't become known. It won't become known in a degrading way. It'll become known in a way that gives glory to God. So if you don't want those sins to be a degrading and demoralizing way, repent, change your life, and then those will become part of the glory of God that a great sinner became a great saint. We can all do that. This is what will add to the glory of God. Oh, wow. Wow. And then the, the form of the judgment. The procedure of the judgment is described in Matthew 25, 31 through 46, and in Revelation 20. In the last judgment, the conduct of, conduct of each of us will be made known, not only in our own consciousness, but to the whole world. That's the difference between the, the particular judgment and the general judgment. In your particular judgment, just you will know everything God shows you. But in the general judgment, you'll know everything about everybody. And everybody says, ooh, that's scary, Father. Yeah, if you haven't repented. But if you've repented, your past will actually give glory to God and to you. It is probable that no words will be spoken in the judgment, theologians tell us. But in one instant, through divine illumination, everybody will thoroughly understand your own moral condition and that of all the others. Romans 2.15. So what is the result of all of this? What is the meaning or the purpose of the general judgment? The divine purpose will be accomplished. What does that mean? That the human race will finally achieve its destiny. Union with God. There's something taking you back to seminary that I learned called teleology. Telios, telos. That means everything has a reason for which it was created. And whether or not you achieve that is up to you. An acorn, his teleos is to become an oak tree. A kitten, teleology is to become a cat. You, your teleos, your teleology is union with God. Why were you created? To know God, love him and serve him and be happy with him forever in heaven. That's question one of the Baltimore Catechism. My goodness, this all fits together. There is nothing more beautiful in the existence of the world than this Catholic faith. Nothing. And that's why the great scholars of other religions like Scott Hahn, Steve Ray, Deacon Alex Jones, Tim Staples, when they sat down to disprove the Catholic faith, they ended up becoming Catholic. This is the beauty we have in our faith. God bless you all. Continue to be part of our Marian family. If Brother Mark can show up on our screen real quick. Please join us. You can visit micprayers.org. It doesn't cost anything. It takes less than 10 seconds. I don't care if you ever give a dollar, but I will be responsible before God to bring souls to him. And I believe truly this is one of the greatest ways. Next to the sacraments, become a Marian helper. Share in the graces of our penances, our rosaries, our prayers, our masses. Now, if you'd like to hear some of these talks, the next slide, Mother Mark, you can get our DVD on shopmercy.org or call the number 800-462-7426. And if you want to really get an explanation of how we do it, our last slide will be the book, Understanding Divine Mercy, which you can also get on shopmercy.org or 1-800-462-7426. God bless you. You all hung in there with me. Thank you so much. And let's have a great Advent season starting tomorrow. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.